Hey everyone, I'm Charting Man Dan of the Chart Guys. I've been trading cannabis stocks for 13 and a half years at this point. In this video, we're going to check in on the sector after some hype to end last week, a lot of volume. We're going to look at the major charts. We're also going to look at the psychedelic sector as well. Before we get into it, just going to give a bit of a, an overview, a fundamental recap. As there are people in the crypto world, congrats on your gains, and they're looking to potentially rotate in. And one of the accounts, one of the larger crypto accounts that I've been following for a while on Twitter, Credible Crypto, Give him a follow, check him out. But he recently posted about switching to the, not switching, but at least getting into the cannabis sector, MSOS, and a couple other plays. And again, that resonates for me because 2017 to 2018, the best macro rotation trade of my life was taking crypto profits and going into the Canadian cannabis sector as that euphoria run was, was getting going. And so now we're watching, you know, there's definitely some day-to-day -day inverse relationship between these two sectors. And a lot of people are wondering, are crypto profits going to start coming towards this sector? And if there is a headline catalyst, maybe we see some retail FOMO getting involved. But where we stand right now, essentially, you know, just a quick history over the last few years, we had a, a strong sector run up. It got its own ETF and getting its own ETF helped run this sector up into the election of Biden because it was a blue wave and now the Democrats got the Senate and the House and the presidency and we're going to see fundamental change and all these names ran up and they had a really nice uh, move, a lot of, you know, multiple hundreds of percent, some of them 500 plus percent and a thousand percent. So a lot of people got excited and then it was just a slow bleed from there. And the ETF, in my opinion, was acting uh, counter to, to the bulls. And I think that's going to happen eventually in crypto as well. But it was just, oh my God, nothing's changing. They're not doing anything. And it was a slow bleed and the bears jumped all over it. We, we saw a crypto type pullback. We pulled back, you know, 80% plus in a lot of these names. And we're just hoping now that we can bottom out and start a, a new cycle with the headlines behind it. And so right now you have the Canadian names, CGC, TLRY, Cron, OGI. They're on one side. They had a massive euphoria run in 2017, 2018. There was massive mismanagement by these companies, overstating expectations, failing to deliver, lots of dilution. A lot of these names have lost 95% plus of their uh, share price. And, you know, they will benefit if we get headlines. Absolutely. Some of these names have so many shorts on them because they've been so weak that we do get nice short squeezes, little fast 100% moves when there is a big headline in this sector. But overall, people are generally focusing on the U.S. names, which uh, whose balance sheets look much more favorable for longer term. And uh, that's MSOS, the ETF. And then the top three major names, GTBIF, TCNNF, CURLF. Then there's a bunch of smaller listed names. These names are traded on the OTC, which means they're much harder for large capital to get into. I can't market by $100,000 in these names without moving the price and having slippage. And that's very different than buying $100,000 of the names like CGC, TLRY that are listed on a higher exchange. There's a lot more dollar volume that trades there when things get going. So one of the potential future catalysts is uplisting of these names because CGC and, and these other names were the same thing. They were on lower exchanges. They uplisted. Their dollar volume went like 10, 20, 30 X. And it just became a place to now trade that people had otherwise stayed away from because of the exchange they were traded on. So some of the catalysts that we're looking towards, you know, if we get safe banking, that could potentially open things up to uplist. Maybe it doesn't, you know, we got to look at the details of, of what it says, but uh, also tax advantages. There's a lot of uh, tax disadvantage to being a cannabis company. And so trying to get those laws changed, there's some gray area right now around that, but generally speaking, uh, disadvantaged in terms of taxes to the tune of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for some of these names. Uh, another short-term catalyst is, of course, if we get the DEA agreeing with the HHS recommendation that we should be Schedule 3. And that HHS recommendation pretty much put in a bottom in the sector with massive volume. Then we faded when everybody realized there's no rush here. This is going to take a while. But uh, it's there's a lot of cynical people in this sector. And I know crypto people know what it's like to bag hold through a bear market. But this cannabis bear market is worse than the last two crypto bear markets that I've seen. And it's just so disheartening. And there's a lot of, of cynicism in the sector. A lot of people are going to sell when they get back to break even or small green because of how terrible of an, an experience. You know, a lot of people, this is the worst decision they've ever made is putting money 
for investment in the cannabis sector. I'm a trader. I'm always in and out with the euphoria and momentum. And, you know, I'm not looking to invest in this space. So that's where I'm coming from. But uh, overall, that would be a major catalyst. Again, you know, what's the headline that's going to get the herd involved and get institutions and big money involved? And one more would be Florida. So if we get to April 1st without any word from the Florida Supreme Court, that means there is going to be a vote in November for legalization. It has to get 60% to pass. And that would be huge for the companies that are focused there. That's why I'm focusing on Florida names a bit more in March for that potential short-term catalyst and then that mid-term catalyst into November as well. TCNNF is easily the leader there. And if you see that get legalized in Florida, their target market is going to two to three X just because of the population of the state is massive and the amount of tourists is massive. And, uh, you know, that's something that is a nice catalyst because it doesn't require anything from the federal government. And the federal government has been the hang up and just slow grinding, nothing changing. And you're going to hear people on Twitter joking about soon and imminent because we've been getting this dangling carrot for years and years in this sector. And eventually it'll happen. But uh, at this point, we're beyond words and rumors. We need actionable, concrete changes. Let's get to the charts and see where we stand. Real quick, we've got a cannabis hub on our website. Shout out to Chart Guys Toby who put this together. Just compiling information. You know, we got all our technical analysis videos. We've got uh, headlines, some articles talking about the space, the, the Florida situation, your watch list over here, some basic charts, basic technical analysis, and more information on the individual companies. You can click True Leave here, go to Fundamentals, little bit of a market profile, some financials, things like that. So uh, please to check out. I'll link it in the comments on YouTube and on Twitter. All right, so MSOS, the ETF, that's where the action and the dollar volume is because it is listed on a higher exchange. And so that is essentially uh, giving access to larger players to the sector. And the mechanics of it and the way it goes is they, you know, you can't touch pl the Schedule 1 drug and be listed on a higher exchange. So what the ETF does is hold these companies through swaps. And essentially, if a lot of money comes into the ETF and the ETF runs significantly higher than its holdings, then it issues an, then it has an inflow, it issues shares for cash, and then it uses that cash to buy the underlying individual companies. And then that makes them rise up and catch up to the ETF. And one thing that was very different about Friday is, you know, massive volume. Some of that has to do with quad witching. And that was a good point from somebody on Twitter where uh, volume is higher for everything on a quad witching day. But, uh, and again, anything that I say that you don't know, jump on Google or jump on our website and search for it because that's the kind of thing you want to be doing to continue gaining knowledge. I'm not going to give you everything in a two hour video. If there's something you don't understand, write it down and then later dig into it deeper. But uh, the volume is massive here. Just in the sense that it's 16 million, I can go back and say, all right, it's pretty much tied for the highest volume day that we've seen since the HHS uh, suggested Schedule 3 for the DEA. And now we're waiting on a DEA's decision. And uh, we've got uh, the highest volume in like six months almost. That's a lot. And a couple of things that happened on Friday. Number one, uh, there's there's a, a larger a, a trader or investor with a larger holding, Doug Cass, says he's going into the sector, enters with size, Instantly, it's down 10%. And then the, there's a rumor that, you know, in, in the elevator, Cory Booker says it's coming soon in April, blah, blah, blah. I don't care at all about that rumor. It means nothing to me. At this point, we've heard of 50 rumors, whatever. Get some eyes, great. Other than that, we had Kamala Harris on Friday having a round table with Fat Joe and others about uh, cannabis. And it was only the intro that was public and then the rest was private, but uh, she made a statement essentially, you know, it's absurd that it's absurd that we are schedule one, the same as, you know, heroin or whatever she, she uh, compared it to. And we're waiting on the DEA and hurry up is essentially what the message was. And so it's clear that the administration wants progress, further progress on this front. And it's clear that they're going to try and leverage that into the election in November for some positive uh, sentiment from the population. So that's a good thing. But again, we need concrete announcement from the DEA. Right now, you know, I've, I've been bouncing around back and forth and I am back in the sector now with my core holding 
but if I'm going to go aggressive with size, it has to be on concrete official change news where I expect the move to last days for something like this. So if I market by a significant amount of my portfolio, then uh, you know, green right away and follow through for days as the hype makes its cycles around Reddit and all that. There is a two times leverage ETF, MSOX. If you want more exposure with less capital, this is where you look. It's more thinly traded. It magnifies the moves in both directions, but uh, something to keep an eye on if you want more uh, leverage and exposure. So overall, where MSOS stands, it was a beautiful close on Friday. Volume poured in. And again, it's unusual that we did not have inflows on Friday. Usually high volume means inflows. And my takeaway is that there was a lot more buying of the individual companies than we've seen. Where again, if it's, if it's all the buying concentrated in MSOS, they have inflows, they issue shares, and then they buy the companies. But this was other people, whether it's retail or whoever, buying the individual companies just as much as the ETF was being bought. So, you know, let me know what you think in terms of theories of what that means, but not a huge takeaway for me, just a little bit different. So huge move off this low. And now we're looking at a couple resistance zones here around $9. On the way down, we topped out at 893 and then a few times at uh, 916, 918. And so that's, I'm just viewing that as a resistance band. And you remember on the way down, those were some key short-term levels that rejected the price. So that's gonna be the battleground on Monday and into this coming week. We also have to make note, the broader market is showing us the most weakness we've seen in like six to eight weeks. And that's, you know, bad timing, but it's a good sign that the volume offset that on uh, Friday for this sector. So again, for me personally, I'll let you know what positions I have. I guess I'll do that now. MSOS, TCNNF, OGI, some small amount of TSNDF. It's a small amount, a small enough amount that I'm not even really caring about it at this point. And that's it for cannabis at the moment. And I'm focusing more on Florida names, TCNNF. And that's because, again, as I mentioned, with the catalyst for Florida coming. And so recently, you know, I took, I exited all, the majority of my core position into this weakness and played some of the psychedelic sector. And there you, there hype that we'll talk about that. <clears throat> But then I started getting stopped out of my running positions, take some, take some profit in psychedelics, get stopped out of the runner positions, and then going back into the cannabis sector and just essentially rotating those profits around. And again, I know I'm talking in hindsight, but a little bit of proof, a little bit of proof, just in terms of, you know, loading up uh, TCNNF a couple, I guess, I don't know when this was, the 8th, March 8th, what day was that? It was in a $9 range. And again, just rotating back in, focus on the Florida longs, not the previous. So for previously, I got a core MSOS, simple for me, that's just what I'm doing. But now I've got, you know, 60% TCNNF, 40% MSOS, and just doing that a little bit and keeping an eye on uh, whether it continues to outperform. So what I need to see from here, obviously continuation, uh, you know, one scenario would be if we fail 969, bulls would hope for that to be uh, daily inverse head and shoulders shaping up. We have to keep in mind, we haven't confirmed a daily uptrend yet. We're coming straight off the consolidation low. So whenever we do top out, best case scenario for the bulls would be for hourly oversold to mark a daily higher low and then confirm a daily uptrend. So obviously bulls want to see as much follow through as possible before we top out, but then watching for it from there. Key support in the short term, there was a lot of price action in the 830s all afternoon on Friday. And so I want to see 8.30 hold a back test as support. And so what that would mean would be, you know, where's 8.30 on the daily chart? So I want to see, in an ideal world, a little bit of follow through, at least on Monday. And then if we top out, hold 8.30 for a daily higher low and try and see that follow through. That's just dictating my ideal scenario. And then as it plays out every single day, I'm gonna get more information telling me, yeah, your ideal scenario is playing out or nope, your ideal scenario is not playing out. And that's gonna dictate how I maneuver and, and whether I go aggressive or get more conservative or whatever. So very good day. And 830 support, that range is resistance in the short term, 969, the most important uh, shorter term resistance. And we'll see how much follow through we can get. CNBC talked about it Friday afternoon. There's a little bit of after hours action in the Canadian names we'll look at in just a moment. But uh, again, generally speaking, this move, these moves that are words only do get sold into. Now, I think our low is in for a while, which is why I was 
jump, jumping back in. And in the end, you know, my maneuver of exiting and then re-entering, non-event. You know, I, I essentially, I bought TCNNF cheaper, but I bought MSOS, you know, a tiny bit cheaper and a tiny bit more expensive than I sold it. So in the end, it was an, a non-event for my uh, portfolio and account, but uh, it just allowed me protection. And then again, sitting at the computer all day, I can react quickly and be in and out, but back in and we'll see if we can follow through this time. So the individual names, why I care about true leave. And, and again, one thing about trading on the OTC is, you know, this, these wicks, did we get up to 1188 on Friday? I would say no. Why? Go to the five second chart. Look at the volume. There's no volume to take this candle up to 1188. I know that the shares that were positioned from 1130 to 1188 were not all filled on the order book because it would take way more volume. I mean, look at this volume at 11. You know, there was, there was a nice round psychological number that had a lot of shares on it. But I mean, clearly you get 11,000 shares or 27,000 shares with no price movement. And to see an 8% price move or six, whatever it was with that amount of volume, that just tells me it didn't happen. So I would treat the high of the day as 1125. That did happen. I watched it happen. And even this wick, again, at the end of the day, you know, did we drop down in the last minute? No, there's not enough volume there that would take out all the, the bids on the order book so, you know, there's, there's tomfoolery that goes on in the OTC. The market makers can open things where they want. If you go back and talk about, or go back and where I was talking about this gap up open, I was saying the market makers, this is, you know, some manipulation where they can open it wherever they want and watch for that to potentially mark a top because of that gap on a day where it made no sense to gap up. And so just be aware of that with the OTC names and the market maker game. So if I'm, you know, want to visualize this chart, how it played out to me, the high of the day is right about there. And 1196 is right there as well. Why I like TCNNF is again, the Florida exposure. I like just holding this weekly EMA 12 and MSOS failed to do so. And that's what made me concerned about MSOS. Um, and, you know, we're trying to recover, but uh, it's different in the sense that if MSOS is going to see continuation to a higher high, we need 20%. If TCNNF is going to see continuation to a higher high, we need less than, we just half that. We need 10% and we're there. And so it's stronger. There's relative strength. TCNNF, you know, in crypto, we divide all coins by Bitcoin to see relative strength. We do that in this sector as well, all sectors. TCNNF divided by the ETF MSOS. And I can see that it is the strongest it's ever been compared to the ETF. There's just screaming relative strength. And back in the day, we were talking about when we break this level, pay attention, look at all these rejections, that will be telling us that relative strength is returning for the first time in a long time. And that followed through better than bulls could have ever hoped. And so as long as we keep this relative strength, a bit of a wonky day on Friday with the candles, but uh, as long as we keep that relative strength, I keep a uh, Florida focus. And wouldn't be surprised, you know, if we do get confirmation it's on the ballot that that relative strength starts to fade a little bit, you know, because we have then seven months to go. But um, that's why I like TCNNF. So I want to see the bulls on TCNNF. And again, this after hours doesn't mean anything to me. So I want to see the bulls hold 1049 on Monday. And again, resistance for me is 1125. I guess we'll look to 1188 after that because there's not much else nearby, but uh, 1125 and 1049 are the two levels I care about in the short term. I did add a little bit on, on uh, Friday morning, but didn't get my full position filled because again, you know, I, I only wanted to add, let's see, I was going to add 50, $55,000. And again, to even try and do that uh, is difficult on something this thinly traded. So I got you know, 20% of my order filled at 10, 10, but then the price just ran away really quickly. And so again, when everybody's trying to go through the door at the same time, these things move significantly in both directions because of the lack of liquidity. Cureleaf, big time move off the low, one of the bigger percentage gains on Friday. And I really like the, just an equilibrium here. You know, I love equilibriums. The two week time frame just shows us a long-term tightening range. Top, low, lower high, and we're trying for this higher low. And so watching for this tightening range to break sometime in the coming month or so. And bulls would love, you know, essentially because of the move and the volume we've seen off this current low, those are must hold levels from here on out. If those levels break from here, and I'm talking about these lows for every name, if the lows where we just came from break, big red flag. It's the same thing. You know, this is a macro version of 
of me saying, I think the bottom's in because of the volume and the magnitude of this move on the you know many month chart, Friday, that volume is saying that needs to be the bottom. If it's not, it's a red flag. So Cure Leap, zooming in, where's our support here? Bulls want to hold 458. And again, you know, that wick, I don't, I'm not, do, if you want to zoom in and see if that wick's real or not, whatever, but, uh, you know, I don't care about Cureleaf as much, so I'm not going to spend as much time on it. Same deal, got to confirm the daily uptrend. And again, you can keep an eye on Cureleaf divided by MSOS. It's a tightening weekly range, and I'm just viewing this as an equilibrium as well. This is the two-week time frame, so we've just been tightening up. And when this breaks, uh, we'll get some indication, are we strengthening or weakening versus the ETF? But if we're trading sideways, it pretty much means we're just doing the same thing the ETF is doing. GTBIF uh, was a lead bull before True Leaf took over. So definitely still one of the stronger names overall. We double topped to the penny and rolled over. Again, we got to confirm the daily uptrend, short term. And again, when you see me going through this, I'm doing the same thing on all these names. So I'm obviously not covering all the names in the sector, but uh, keep, you know, apply what I'm doing. I zoom into the hourly and I find the hourly support from midday. And then I look at, you know, you can do this on your own. So that's ideally what we're trying to do here is give you some information to then allow you to be, you know, smarter with regards to some technical analysis. So support is 1223 here, got back up to resistance 13 and 1304. So clearly 13 psychological, a little bit of a resistance zone to be watching first thing, but bulls really want to hold 1223 to keep progress on this move up. And then eventually we got to confirm that daily uptrend once we top out. And GTBIF divided by MSOS. Again, not, not a whole lot changing here. Bigger picture, weekly time frame. This is us weakening because true leave was strengthening. CRLBF is, you know, one of the other, probably maybe like the fourth major name in the sector, but uh, it's been relatively weaker for a very long time. That said, keep an eye on this falling wedge, CRLBF divided by MSOS. This pattern is going to break within, you know, the next month. And if it's a bull break, that will be the first significant sign of some relative strength returning. And that will tell us this, this name is acting as a laggard if this pattern can break bull. So worth keeping an eye on that just to see how it can shape up. As far as the smaller cap names in the US, uh, CXXIF, a lot of people were asking about it. They're just going to be leveraged versions of these larger names. They're going to move up faster in, in euphoria. They're going to drop faster on consolidation. And so, you know, this pullback here, this is almost a 50% pullback. And that run is 100% plus run. So if you're looking for more volatility, you know, these are the names, but they don't have enough dollar volume for me. You know, this name traded, that can't be. Did it trade 281 shares on Thursday? That's insane. Anyways, you know, we're trading... We're trading like $150,000. No, we're trading way less than that. 10,000 shares is 3,000. We're trading like $15,000 a day. That for me, you know, if me and a group of buddies can ch shape what a chart looks like, I don't want anything to do with it. Because that means, you know, one, one person with millions of dollars can completely control a chart like this. So I don't like it. But Key resistance in the short term, we got 3705. Same thing, we just got to confirm a daily uptrend. Every time we've tried to bounce on the way down, that's your resistance zone. So we failed there, failed there, failed there. The peak of the bounce is where we failed. There's a bunch of resistance in the low 40s, but we got to see the, you know, the best case scenario is what happens in crypto is the leader leads, and then we see the profits rotate out and the laggards catch up once there's confidence in the sector as a whole. All right. But generally speaking, at this moment, the smaller cap names are weaker than names like True Leaf and the larger names. So on to the Canadian side. I've been an OGI for a long time at this point. And that's just because of relative strength. It's You look at this weekly chart, look what it's been doing the last few months, and all of its Canadian peers, you know, this is what the TLRY weekly chart looks like. This is what CGC looks like. This is what ACB looks like. It's going opposite. It's going, you know, it's doing exactly what a bull wants. I don't even know the fundamentals of this company at all. I can't tell you, I mean, you know, Canadian based, that's all I know about this company, but I'm profiting because the charts told me there's relative strength here and it gave me clear levels to play off of. And so 178 is a key daily level the bulls want to maintain. Big day on Friday with everything else. 210 is resistance and then 222. 
And at this point, I got my stop under 178. It's a risk-free position in the sense that, you know, I, I got in earlier, I took some profit and just comfortably trying to let it play out. There are some uh, lines here that I'm keeping an eye on, just some visual guides trying to get over this downtrend resistance line. It's a bit of a channel. And so key support here in the short term, bulls want to maintain 195, ideally too psychological on a pullback, but 195 is the hourly higher low and 210 is resistance. The other names are trying to put in a bottom, but they've got work to do. I've been saying the same thing about TLRY and CGC for the last two months. I mean, check the videos. If we do not break the lower highs, it's complete bear control. Nothing changes. I just hope there's one person out there that realized that information and it saved them some money because it's as clear a trend as you can have. Every single bounce for the last two months is a lower high. Lower high, lower high, lower high. I guess we could do one there as well. Lower high, lower high. Is this going to be different? Well, break the lower highs. Bulls haven't done it in two months. Prove something to me. Break 177. That would tell me something's different. Something that there's a pattern for two months that is now no longer the case. And after hours, it was being run up. And so a gap up open is likely on Monday. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see a gap up open into some profit taking. Bulls need to set an hourly higher low on any profit taking. But uh, again, same thing. We need to break the lower highs and then confirm the daily uptrend to try and follow through. And again, just showing, you know, the kinds of moves when momentum gets going, there's a 100% move. And so again, there, there are short squeeze possibilities because I don't need to even look at, you know, a lot of people look at short data and that's fine. I don't look at it. I don't need to. I know there's a bunch of shorts on this name because I know as a technical analyst and a trader, being bearish on this name is the right thing to be doing. And now that's changing, obviously. So, you know, I'd be covering Friday if I'm a bear just to protect, but um, I just know that there's a lot of bears because that's the right direction of this chart. And now it's the bulls trying to change that and trying to shift things. And CGC is the exact same. Every single move is just a lower high, lower high. Look at how many bear flags, bear flag confirmed, bear flag confirmed, bear flag confirmed. And we're dropping down now. Again, just talked about the euphoria run. Look at this pullback. How do we go from 565 to $3? Dilution, reverse splits. This is this stock's never going back to all-time highs, in my opinion. That's, I don't make bold you know, statements like that often, but when I'm real confident, I do not think this name will ever go back near all-time highs because of the dilution. It's not the same company. You know, buying, buying 10,000 shares back here, you're owning a fraction of the company as to buying $10,000 now. It's a, it's a very different share structure at this point. But again, same thing. They ran it up after hours, you know, 355. That's a potential solid gap up open on Monday. I do expect some of that will be given back before the open on Monday. But again, that'll give the space to say, okay, we've broken lower highs. Something's a bit different. Can we confirm a daily uptrend as the result of the next pullback? And again, just looking at the little short squeezes here for trading. These names are for trading, but this was a short squeeze back in August where we shoot up from three to 400 or 400%, three to 19. And what happened here was the MSOS names were already running and were starting to chill out a little bit. And then we, you know, went up to, to 100% move in a couple of days. That's a short squeeze because why? Look at how, look at this bear control. You know, there's shorts all over this. It's the easiest bear chart in the world until the volume shows up and causes a mini squeeze. So the reason I keep an eye on these names is, for the potential that they get the fast, hard squeezes when the volume really starts coming in. But if you're looking longer term, the share structure, the fundamental of these companies, potentially not as uh, well positioned as some of these US names. All right, psychedelics, I'm taking a pause. Quick psychedelic fundamental check-in. So uh, these names are very low cap, very high risk, high reward. Anything that has to do, you know, with changing laws and things like that are as high risk, high reward you, as you can get in markets. And uh, there's, you know, they're thinly traded, same deal, but they have some headlines coming in. And so in the past week, we've gotten MNMD has, uh, the FDA has granted them breakthrough therapy status for LSD because they came out with LSD trials and the results were convincing enough. Essentially, you get that designation from the FDA when your results are significantly better than what's on the market. And for this, it was general anxiety disorder. 
And so the results were significantly better than the current treatments for general anxiety. And so that led to a uh, really nice reaction. You know, we were up 80% that day, 80% plus. We gave a lot of it back, you know, crazy volatility. But 80% plus that day, as huge volume poured in, because these names, you know, these names are potential buyout uh, targets for the biotech sector. And as they continue to get, you know, legitimacy from these three letter agencies in the government, uh, you know, that's a bullish catalyst. That's concrete. That's, that's not rumors about FDA status. That is FDA status. That's a very different scenario than what the cannabis sector has been getting. CYBN was another one that was granted breakthrough status this past week. The, the thing to note is these names are for trading for me, not for investing. And that's because they are having to dilute to raise funds for more, more trials and to keep the lights on and to, you know, you know, they're not profitable companies. And so uh, that's an assumption. I'm, I'm not reading balance sheets, but I'm assuming they're not profitable companies. So what they've been doing is announcing their positive try results and announcing dilution to raise funds. And MNMD did it and the price still went really well, but CYBN did it. We gapped up and we sold off all day. And that's because the amount of dilution in CYBN was percentage wise way more significant as far as the outstanding shares of the company versus what MNMD did. But uh, that's where the company, where the, the sector stands right now. Again, some individual states uh, decriminalize and even, you know, starting to sell some, some psychedelic mushrooms and things like that. And so uh, I have interest in this sector. I mean, for me, microdosing and psilocybin has changed my life as a human being and as a trader. I would not be the trader that I am without it. It is, you know, great. It has been a great teacher for emotional control, for, you know, zooming out and perspective of life and what's really important and, you know, detaching me from falling in love with fundamental stories and just treating it as flashing numbers in cyberspace. Uh, I could make a whole video on that and someday in the future, I might be working in this industry a little bit. I've got some ideas, but we'll uh, save that for another time. So very interested in this space. Again, same thing. If, if hype and euphoria come knocking, these names are so thinly traded, they will run hundreds of percent. So keep an eye on potential headlines that could get retail or you know others excited. And, and the, the news in MNMD this past week, the volume, the dollar volume was definitely more than retail getting involved. Let's look at the charts. So CMPS is one of the largest names in terms of market cap. And, you know, we were watching it back here for this nice little, now I won't call it a cup and handle because it's a continuation pattern. This was a reversal, but bull flag, break of resistance, getting over a, a long-term downtrend resistance line, but struggling a little bit right now. I never want to see a bull flag straight into a pullback. That for me is a red flag. And now the bulls have to be cautious of a potential weekly head and shoulders. If we do hold support, we're testing that key support on the weekly chart. You know, bulls, when, once you get EMA 12, you just want to ride it up and hold that for a nice strong trend, but uh, at risk of losing it and back to testing 956. And I've been a bit surprised, you know, the correlations are strong in cannabis where the sector moves together and the ETF is part of that. But the ETFs in, in psychedelics get no volume. It's like, you know, $200,000 is a high volume day. So you're not seeing people buy the ETF and then the ETF buy the underlying. So things move together. So there's a lack of correlation. And so recently, you know, I tried to play the MNMD news and then, you know, I did and then get into laggards for their move up and it was very short lived. And so ended up, you know, taking some profit and then getting stopped out of my runner positions, moving back to cannabis focus from there. But uh, again, just a trading vehicle for me, but not ready for major hype at this point. Short term, absolutely. And again, worth keeping an eye on, but CMPS key 958, I wouldn't be surprised you know, if we hold 958, we can easily trade within this range for a long time. It's a pretty wide range. So, you know, range bound, I'm not interested in. And, you know, we could do something like this for a while. If we break support, that makes me even less interested as a bull. So uh, key 956 support in play. MNMD. So I've had a runner position here from, you know, way back in the threes and uh, just letting it go and just walking up my stop. And again, we're just riding up daily EMA 12. So it was a bullish chart. There was relative strength in this name compared to cannabis. And then the headline comes out. You get the 80% plus day. Then you get, you know, it's trading very well technically. Right now we've got a four hour equilibrium. These tightening ranges are very likely after high volatility. So you look for them, but we also had the back burner. And this one was a little bit tricky. I didn't, I didn't go aggressive on it. That's the wrong one. But again, it was just after a euphoria breakout 
first hourly oversold conditions marked the daily higher low. So a bunch of chart guys members uh, were a little bit more risk on than I was buying this dip. You know, I bought this dip on Tuesday, but I exited into the short term bounce because I didn't want to increase my swing size. The bulls didn't prove enough that night, but the next day they followed through significantly. So, you know, very nice to see an hourly back burner result in 20% plus gains. But just riding daily EMA 12, trying to make our way back up. Solid bull day on Friday in the face of a very bearish broader market. We've got a clear base of support down here in the upper sevens, clear short-term resistance, 930s. But I wouldn't be surprised to tighten up now on the daily where we do something, you know, like this. <clears throat> but I'm just gonna let my runner go to smaller position size because of the amount of volatility, but a nice trading instrument. Uh, volume here, again, why did I say it's more than retail getting involved? Because you went from average volume of like $5 million a day, three to $5 million a day. Then on that news day, we had like $350 million traded. So that's bigger money getting involved. And we'll see how it shapes up from here, expecting a bit more tightening range. CYBN, again, gap up massive profit taking. And now just tightening up as well, multiple daily inside bars. It's a higher low every day. That pattern's still intact the last seven days, so bulls will take it. But a lot of work to do, weekly chart. You know, from where we came from, bulls want to be ideally, you know, shaping up this monthly chart. We've now held the 30 cent zone multiple times. Obviously need to get back to the recent high, but uh, I don't love penny stocks. I don't love dilution. I learned my lessons. I held, you know, I made, made 700% in penny stocks turning $7,000 to $49,000 when I was like 22. I was like, oh my God, I'm a genius. I found the next penny stock that's gonna make it and gave it all back because of dilution and just slow bleed. And that's how I learned about debt and convertible, convertible debt and dilution. And again, Google chart guys, dilution. I got a whole video talking about it. And it's something you need to be aware of if you're doing anything more than trading underdeveloped low cap sectors like this. ATAI, so here's an example of being wrong. And as a trader, your goal is to just be wrong as soon as possible. And so I got in this name, I was already in a position and you know, I think I was entering from back here and I added to my position for the potential. It was a laggard on Thursday and it worked Thursday, you know, from the low of the day on Thursday, we went up, went up 15%. As soon as we broke the high of Thursday on Friday with only two pennies of follow through, that's where I had my uh, that's where I started taking profit because that was a red flag for me. That's where, you know, I sold some ATAI. And then, so my profit taking from that day was going into true leave. And then I, I just leave a runner position. And so I put my stop under 190 and say, all right, if we can maintain the daily uptrend, I'll keep my runner just like worked well for MNMD, but I stopped out. And so that's that. This did not get the follow through that I was looking for in terms of a laggard move. And so I'm not interested in it with its current setup. I was wrong that it was going to see significant follow through as a laggard. And so I get I find out that I'm wrong in a couple of days and I'm out. And that's the way to be a trader. And so, you know, I'm still interested in the sector, but clearly, you know, this these significant headlines, great for MNMD, good for CYBN, but overall not a sector mover. So uh, watching for something that is a sector mover, but not ready just yet. All right, feel free to ask any questions. This is a Mondo video. If you made it to the end of this, shout out to you. You are in the top 5% of traders putting an effort, that's for sure, or investors or whatever. And we'll see you soon. Let's see how it goes Monday. Bulls just wanna maintain those hourly higher lows and uptrends. Make sure and do good things.